Welcome to Office Hours. You have given us a lot to think about and to respond to from the last module on the rise of the Chinese Communist Party. I'm here with Philip. Philip, welcome back. Hi, Professor. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. And a couple of announcements as we begin. Uh, there is a slight delay, I am told, with the release of the Part 8 certificates. So we're grateful for your patience. Uh, but for those who have passed it, uh, and you'll find out soon, con congratulations. Wonderful. And uh, additionally, as many of you have noticed in Part 9, uh, learners are divided into two cohorts. Right. So there'll be Nationalist a and communist. <laughs> no, not quite. Well, we've, we've just termed you cohort A and B. Uh, cohort A and at B. At this point. So you'll see it on the screen. Right. And that should allow for you know, closer discussions. Yes. We're hoping it'll be more intimate. Uh, we had a question on the music. Uh, so we were hoping we could get a few words from, from you, Professor Kirby, on the relevance of uh, right. this, this module's music. So the great famous song is the Internationale, written uh, in the aftermath of the famous Paris Commune of 1870 by a French revolutionary poet and transport worker, Eugène Potier. He composed the words, and the melody was composed by Pierre de Gaiter. The Chinese version of this has become de facto the anthem of the Chinese Communist Party and translated as the Guoji Gu, the or the International Song, quite literally, first translated in 1923 uh, by a famous communist, uh, Chu Chou Bai, who would later become head of the party, uh, but would later lose that position and then, in fact, lose his life to the nationalists in 1935. Uh, and his translations of several of these stanzas are still the official Chinese versions. So. That's a, it, it is a great song in any language. Wonderful. Now, we have all kinds of questions from you guys, and they're very, I think, uh, they're ones that I had not really thought of asking in quite the same. So, why don't you uh, ask a few of these? Absolutely. Thanks so much for the questions. Uh, one of our first is, when was Mao's Red Book written? It's a gr so, when was Mao's Little Red Book written? When you think about it, it was compiled by Lin Biao in the 1960s uh, for the Cultural Revolution, or the ramp to the Cultural Revolution. But it was written, of course, since it's a range of snippets of Mao's works from the 1920s on, so written in some sense anywhere between the 1920s and the 1960s. And some of these earlier pieces had, since their original release, been rewritten. Nice. So there are different quotations from different periods of, of Mao's career. Uh, and uh, one can the great thing about being in a position to have your collected and selected works and then your quotations released, you have the privilege, if you're Chairman Mao, of changing what you wrote years ago. I see. So an evolutionary work of sorts. It's an evolutionary <laughs> work. And so you can't always say precisely when it was written, in I other see. words. Uh, we had another question about what drove the Chinese peasants to the point of violent revolution? Well, I think this is this is a very good question if you make the question itself into a problem to be addressed. Uh, the peasants, I think Mao's assessment in, in the Hunan Peasant Movement Report of depredation and uh, terrible conditions and also a huge social divide between gentry and non-gentry in the countryside certainly has a great deal of power to it. Uh, at the same time, there's no evidence that there was a peasant revolution in the first half of the 20th century. There was a party-led revolution uh, and a military conquest of China by the Chinese Communist Party that relied on peasants to be the soldiers and the workers for, of this revolution. And I think the way of thinking about it is that the Chinese Communist Party mobilized farmers better than their adversaries, the nationalists, to fight on their behalf. But the farmers themselves did not rise up as Mao had once imagined this tide doing. They were mobilized, many of them conscripted, uh, into military service for a civil war that at the end of the day would be a conquest, a military conquest uh, of China. And I think one of you all suggested we could uh, have in the next version of this better maps of the civil war period, and I think that's a very good idea. It's a wonderful idea. Um, a Third question seems to deal with what caused the failure of the Kuomintang, 
mm -hmm. and if there is any chance for it to succeed and keep its ruling in China. It's a great what-if question. It's like, what if the Empress Dowager had lived to be 150 or something? You know, there's no one answer. Uh, my personal assessment is that without the Japanese invasion, the Guomindang would have had an excellent chance of maintaining power on the mainland for a very, very long period of time because by the middle of the 1930s, things were going actually quite well. Not perfectly by any means, many challenges, but enormous progress on foreign relations, dealing with the foreign powers within China, right. with the exception of the Japanese. Um, uh, a uniform currency, the beginnings of what we've called this engineering state of trying to remake China in a modern way, physically. Uh, the beginnings of experiments in land reform, but not very much yet by, that, by the outbreak of the war. And by the end of the war, they're really a shadow of their former selves. Uh, the military is much diminished. I think we mentioned uh, in one of the earlier modules that uh, two-thirds of Chiang Kai-shek's officer corps was killed in the first months of the war. Uh, this is the military that, in fact, fought the Japanese. Right. Uh, some 90 percent of the soldiers dying for China died for the nationalist government, for the nationalist cause, for China, but under the nationalist government. And so it was much weaker when it came out. It was also financially so much weaker because of the great inflation, and financing the war by printing money, uh, and more corrupt, to be sure. No, no question about that. Um, but in some sense, it, it, it's an outcome that's inexplicable without the Japanese invasion. That said, and I think this is an important point, uh, in the period from 1945 to 1950, the critical period of particularly 47 to 50 of the Civil War, the communists made the most of their opportunities, had better, old gen better generalship on the field, mm -hmm. and the nationalists made the worst of their opportunities and their very significant advantages in this period of time. Um, there's no one explanation uh, for this uh, failure that would haunt John Kaishek for the rest of his life. Right. That was a wonderful question. Um, we have another one that, that hints a bit at what we've been thinking about here at China X, and it's uh -huh. uh, how did the Soviets feel about Mao uh, after Mao had decided to do things his way? So uh, how did the Russians, how did the Soviet Union, how did Stalin in particular feel about Mao? And I think it's fair to say that uh, it was not a level of great trust not enormous mistrust in the sense of uh, actual antagonism, but the Soviet uh, Mao was not the person whom they had selected to lead the Chinese Communist Party. They had actually selected the first leaders of the Chinese Communist Party, uh, and they had their own candidates uh, who lost out by 1935 to Mao Zedong. Uh, for the leadership of the Chinese Communist Party, people whose loyalty to Moscow could be more easily taken for granted. Right. To be sure, Mao's long march brought him and the Chinese Communist Party closer to the Soviet Union and in better contact from 1937 onward than it had been in Jiangxi and elsewhere. Um, it's a relationship in which you know, the comparative autonomy of the Chinese Communist Movement compared to European Communist movements uh, would be a source actually of strength for the communist movement in China in its march to power within China. Uh, but as you'll see in our next module, uh, the socialist elder brother, tensions that began in this early period uh, would be revisited in the 1950s at the height of an extraordinary period of Chinese-Soviet cooperation in building the new China uh, after 1950. And I think you'll see that there are many ways in which Mao Zedong is a very good student of Stalin and indeed very loyal to Stalin. But after Stalin goes, all bets are off. I see. And uh, a final fascinating question about how the Kuomintang and Chinese Communist Party understood democracy. Yes. Well, you know, democracy is a word that every government proclaims anywhere in the world that it is striving to achieve uh, in a fuller way. Uh, I don't think that, at least as Americans or West Europeans today, would understand that, that Mao Zedong or Chiang Kai-shek had that vision of democracy, of electoral democracy, uh, in mind. Uh, 
the Guomindang from Sun Yat-sen on through Chiang Kai-shek, through Jiang Jingguo, as we'll see later on when we get to Taiwan after 1950, did have electoral democracy as the final goal uh, of the political revolution. Uh, for the Chinese Communist Party, that's never been the case. There are various forms of elections within the party uh, and within committees of the party, but mass suffrage uh, and the idea of, uh, of, an, of a democracy that is defined by people voting for leaders or for policies on a mass basis uh, really is not part of the communist practice after the early 1950s. I see. Well, thank you so much, Professor. Okay. Well, these are these are indeed great great questions. And then we had we asked you how do how do you think of Mao Zedong in historical comparisons? What other leaders in Chinese history or in world history would you compare him to? Uh, and we've got all kinds of wonderful responses from you, but who are the learners' top choices of, with whom do you compare Mao Zedong historically? Well, so we had a number of top choices that ranged. Uh, they, they spanned uh, world history, geography, Chinese history, and they included, uh, number one was probably Joseph Stalin. Stalin. Stalin clearly comes out, in your views, as the number one. If Mao is to be compared with anybody, it's Stalin. Stalin. Mm -hmm. uh, a second one, uh, Alexander the Great. Yes. Also, Genghis Khan, who we've met Alexander before. Alexander the Great is interesting because, unlike Mao, I mean, his his entire life was of military conquest, but he was constantly on a campaign, and the same could be said in a political sense of Mao Zedong. Right. Th that that idea comes up, I think, later in our discussion as well about constant revolution, mm. constant campaigning. We also had Qin Shi Huang. Qin Shi Huang, remember the first emperor of Qin? Yes. Burned the books and buried the scholars. Alive. Create an empire as well. Yeah. Uh, Napoleon in yes. that vein. Zhu Yanzhang. Zhu Yanzhang, founder of the Ming. Yes. Yes. Also Julius Caesar. Caesar. Not Cleopatra. Zhang Qing is Cleopatra. No. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, we also had Sun Yat sen. Sun Yat sen, of course. Of course. And Lenin. And Lenin. Yes. And finally Hitler. And Hitler. Quite a combination, quite a varied group with whom you have compared Chairman Mao. Well, but thank you very much for sending in your, your uh, comparisons. We also had this question of what was the Long March? And we asked you, was it a defeat, a retreat, or a victory? And, and how do people respond here, well, Philip? 8% uh, of you have labeled it a defeat, 17% have labeled it a victory, and 76% of you have labeled it a retreat. A retreat reasonable enough, and one could argue in some way or other for any, either one of these, but I think a retreat is probably the more accurate. I see. Uh, and clearly, it could be a retreat that could lead ultimately to victory, and it's a retreat that came out of defeat. But now we have, I think, the, um, the, the probably the, one of the toughest questions we've ever asked you, because it really involves a lot of thinking of what, uh, what Mao Zedong was as a thinker as well as as an actor, and how he relates to a global intellectual, political, and social movement, uh, which is Marxism. Uh, and we ask you the simple question, which turns t out to require very complicated answers, is Mao a Marxist? Is Mao Zedong a Marxist? How or how not? That's the question we asked. And so what are, what are some of our responses here? Well, we had one that took issue with the problem of definition. So we had Teo Hua Kok mentioning that Marxism's definition is not definitive. There are numerous and sometimes contradictory statements or ideological differences among uh, those espousing the so-called communism. Mm -hmm. And that it seems to be, in uh, Teo Hua Kok's opinion, a convenient brand name for any aspiring revolutionary figures to adopt and to sell their idea with a different mix or formula according to the local taste. Well, quite that's a fascinating. Very, that's a very interesting idea because we've had different groups in the world labeled Maoists uh, in Nepal and in Peru uh, that bear actually not a great deal of resemblance to the early Chinese communist uh, movement. Anyway, that's a that's very good for uh, Teo Hua Kak to question the simplicity of our question. Uh, now, Gwen45 writes in and says, uh, 
I'd say he was clearly a Marxist. Marx's underlying concern was one of economic justice and ownership of the fruits of labor, of getting rid of bullies and corrupt officials in whatever guise they appeared. Uh, and that's a very interesting point. Now, I suppose you, Marx, uh, you'd have to understand and really get into much more complicated uh, discussion of both the earlier and later Marx to understand what he meant by uh, having, but who owns the means of production and how would it be possible right. in a communist state for the proletariat to own the means of production, to own the stuff that they actually produce as industrial workers. Um, the, by the time that Mao Zedong is around, it is the state that will be the true owner of that, at least in the version of Marxism uh, that he inherits from the Soviet Union. I see. Edwin Borst, what does he say? So here we have the opinion that Mao was a realist much more than any other ist. It's a good uh, line. <laughs> it's, it's a great line. Uh, Mao, as here, making use of any argument or theory to achieve his goal, to be in power of China. And later on, we see that it just so happens to be communism, which provided him with the legitimacy. But I think, says Edwin Borst, if communism did not exist, he would have done exactly the same and would have found an alternative legitimization for doing so. That could be. So that's a vision of Mao as conqueror or Mao as a person with great power gust. I think the one thing one could add to it is that in this, uh, in Edwin Borst's view, I think probably thinking about it a bit, he might say that Mao is really a Leninist uh, as much as a Marxist or more than a Marxist because Leninism is a is an organizational means of seizing and maintaining power um, through a very tight uh, political instrument, uh, the party, uh, with a very uh, closed uh, and loyal top leadership. Right. We also had Quest Suzanne write in. Right. She says, I believe Mao shared the fundamental goal of classical Marxism, which was to create a classless socialist society. And I think in some broad sense that, that is absolutely true. However, Mao appears to deviate from classical Marxism as he masterminds his own plan for changing the world order. That is to say, using farmers instead of uh, the urban working class. Now, Andrew Carr goes back and he reads, as you all did, Mao's Hunan report, and really d believes that Mao spoke in that report as a Marxist. So he quotes first Marx and Engels right. and saying, in short, the communists everywhere support every revolutionary movement against the existing social and political order of things. In all these movements, they bring to the front as the leading question in each, the property question, no matter what its degree of the development of in the time. So right. here we have Mao as a Marxist because he's revolutionary and because he's bringing up the property question. Right, and he's, he's seeking to redistribute right. property. And this is right out of the Communist Manifesto, which Mao Zedong absolutely will have read. That we can be 100% sure of. Mitt Varick says, Mao is a Marxist in one key aspect, that Marxist theory is predicated upon struggle, struggle between classes, right. uh, the lower and upper classes. Um, and, and quotes the same quote uh, that our previous commentator had just quoted Absolutely. from the Communist uh, Manifesto. Now, Hamish M. has a somewhat different point of view. Uh, Hamish says that Mao was clearly influenced by Marx in his early thinking, but he was no Marxist in the classical sense. Um, it can be argued that his 1927 report represented a break from his early Marxism, the retreat to the countryside with the rise of prominence of the peasant and the desire for guerrilla warfare was also a move away from Stalin's influence. I think that's quite right. And I think you're, there's a kind of a consistent pattern uh, to these answers, kind of Marxist in, in idealism and, uh, and, 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 and fundamental ideology, but not in practice. Here in, in Midverick and Hamish, we had the interesting point about who is being mobilized. So I yes. remember yes, Midverick yes, yes, yes. mentioning that what real difference does it matter as to whether the lower class is defined as proletariat workers or agrarian peasants? And Hamish going on to say, a guerrilla movement mobilizing peasant masses is very different from a communist party mobilizing urban masses. So this question and is who is mobilized. And Marx himself, if he were to have risen from his grave in the second uh, quarter of the 20th century, would have said there's a very large difference that he really did see the urban working class as the revolutionary class uh, that would, in time, 
seize power and bring about a new order. What we have instead, although Marx might have predicted this as well, since he was an intellectual seeking to lead or at least organize and give intellectual foundations uh, to a revolutionary movement, that in fact none of these movements are in fact led by workers or by farmers. Uh, they're led by intellectuals, uh, usually armed uh, with armed followers and military force. Uh, now, Brian Melva says, what is Marxism? Well, in everyday speak, Marx a Marxist is any left-leaning person you don't like. Even President Obama has been labeled a Marxist by mainstream U.S. media. So it's, you know, it can be a source of praise in certain countries and a source of condemnation. At the end of this quite sophisticated answer, we have the question of, is it possible to be a Marxist while in power? Right. That is to say, if being a Marxist means you are a revolutionary right. and you're seeking constantly to overturn existing orders, once you're in power, do you cease to be a Marxist? Uh, or once you have succeeded in overturning society, do you cease to be a Marxist? And Melva says, in the period after 1949, Lenin is more relevant than Marx for the Chinese Communist Party. And that is almost surely uh, correct. Well, these are, I think, really sophisticated answers to a simple but difficult question, uh, a question that is actually still being debated. If you go to the National Museum in Beijing, you have a new exhibit of modern Chinese history which shows Mao Zedong in the pantheon of Marxist thinkers from Marx, you know, pictures of Marx and Engels and Lenin, uh, as well as Mao Zedong, for some reason Stalin. I can't quite figure out why. Stalin isn't in the National Museum, although he is the one with whom you think uh, that Mao Zedong is perhaps most aptly compared. Thank you so much for your work, uh, for your engagement, and we'll see you next time as we march into the 1950s. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thank you.